Good evening. Ah, what a nice time to be with you. Labor Day was this week, and I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but this, but the holiday this week messed me up in terms of what day of the week it was. <laughs> ah, that's okay. I'm straightened out now. Thankfully, prayer meeting last night got me straightened out. Prayer meeting at church, so that was a good thing. So, so now it's back to the right, the cor- the correct day of the week for me. I'm thankful that it's Thursday, <laughs> as it ought to be. Ah, I hope that you had a good holiday weekend. Good to see you here too, Miss Nancy from Southern California. How is it there? Are are you suffering much from smoke? Are the are the fires close by you there? Um, we've been we've been praying for the folks out west, out on the west coast, California, Oregon. I have a niece who lives in Seattle, and they have quite a bit of uh, they're they're being affected by the smoke, and that's quite a ways away from them, but still. As you well know, smoke travels, so it is smoky there. Boy, I'm glad it's not close to you. That's good, but ah, I just, our earth is growing old, and Jesus is going to make it completely brand new one day. I am so thankful for that. New bodies, new earth. Hey, Valoris, good to see you too. Ah, I know that a lot of people, um, join us and watch the video after after we go live here after it's posted on on my facebook but it's just great to see you and i love it when you make a note that you're here because just even say hi or put a little wave or a thumbs up or whatever just to let me know you're here that way i can see that you're here otherwise i don't know i know that you are here i just don't know who you are (laughs) so i'm glad to see you i'm I'm just getting more prayer requests, it seems, uh, every week. Uh, personal messages, notes on the, on the, uh, the previous post. I go back and read those and pray for you. You're on my heart. You're on my mind uh, as, I, as I go through the week. I just want you to know that, that your prayer requests are being noted. And I hope that you are also praying for some of these requests, Uh, the ones that touch your hearts, the ones that I have for us this week. I have a a friend who has noted, she has mentioned in the past that a prayer request for her cousin. Her cousin's name is Beverly. Beverly had a stroke a bit ago, and and she is not doing well. Uh, She needs a miracle if she's going to, if she's going to survive this. So let's pray for Beverly tonight. I also want to pray for Deline. Deline had uh, a triple bypass surgery recently, and she's home now, and I think doing some better. Um, the last I heard, they were still trying to adjust her medications and get things so that they were just the way they need to be. But let's remember Deline. In prayer, my friend Marcia, who is recovering from open heart surgery, I believe it was a valve replacement. Um, Another friend of mine who lives in Louisiana. Oh, and I should say, um, one of these people, one of these requests comes from Missouri, one comes from Texas, um, one comes from Florida. Marcia is in Florida. A friend of mine in Louisiana has asked that we pray for a friend of her who's. Her daughter has uh, just recently found that she has malignant melanoma in her eye. Uh, you rem- you'll remember that we've mentioned that in the past. Just want to pray. Just want to pray for um, Jessica, who has uh, malignant melanoma in her eye. Um, Nancy mentioned her niece. We want to pray for for her that uh, whatever her needs are, that the Lord knows. And that's the wonderful thing about God is that. He hears what we can't even say. And so we just can praise God for that. Hey, Beverly. Debbie, good to see you. Oh, wow. Let us, we will absolutely pray for Lara. Uh, is it Lara or Lara? Um, I want to say Lara. 
major surgery coming up on Monday. So that's the 14th, just four days from now. Let's absolutely pray. We want to pray for Valora's sister, Anne. And um, she also is in Southern California and not too, too terribly far from the fire. She and Nancy Troyer, who's here with us tonight, uh, both of them, both Anne, uh, Valoris's sister, and Nancy <clears throat> are no doubt experiencing smoke from the f- Lara. Okay. Lara. Lara. Okay. <laughs> Lara. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> I'm not sure I still got it right, but I'm going to say Lara. <laughs> uh, correct me if that's wrong. Just say, say it the other way, and I will. Lara. We'll pray for her. We'll pray for Anne. We'll pray for um, Debbie's daughter, Laura. A friend of mine in Canada asked for prayer for her cousin who is dying of cancer. And another uh, friends, other friends of hers, a clergy couple, retired. Um, he has recently had eye surgery. And you know that eye surgery can take a little bit of a recovery time. Let's pray for them. I don't know their names, either either the cousin or the or the couple, but we'll remember the couple with eye surgery and also um, uh, Patricia's cousin. Hey, Danielle, good to see you. Ah, my next door neighbor in, in from Georgia. I miss you. <laughs> ah, another uh, other friends of mine. I, you've heard me mention the family who lost their four-year-old in a car accident. Um, please continue to pray for, for them. Um, just precious, precious young couple and how devastating the loss. And they are. They are grieving this ter- terrific loss. But they are, st- they are staying strong in the Lord. Please, um, please continue to remember them. And I see my cousin, Deborah. Good to see you, Debbie. Absolutely, you know that your family, my family, is always, always in my prayers. I want to remember my cousin, uh, Debbie, and her family. Ah, oh, so much. Good, good, good. Good things that we can bring to the Lord. So thankful that we have the privilege of taking it to the Lord in prayer. And if I remember, I'm going to post a song after our prayer and study time tonight uh, by, the, by the Oakwood Aeolians. I highly recommend their music. About two years ago, I think it was, they were voted the, the, the best choir in the world. Um, and they are a, uh, it's a, it's a college, a university in North Alabama. And they have the most incredible music But their version of Take It to the Lord in Prayer, you're going to love it. Um, I love you too, Debbie. I love you all. I'm so glad to be with you. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you that we can come to your throne tonight knowing that you hear, that you do the work in our hearts that we need, and you are working in the hearts and lives of our loved ones. Lord, we've mentioned a lot of names, a lot of people tonight, a lot of need, a lot of pain. And some praises, some recovery, and, and, and your presence. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you that you take all of our burdens and you give the answer of love. Thank you. Thank you that your heart of love, the power of your love, is at work constantly in our lives. We ask now that you would be with us as we delve into your word. Help us to understand how this applies to us, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acts chapter 10, I love this story. Starts out, chapter 10, verse 1, in Caesarea, there, was, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was captain of the Italian regiment. So he really was, a, he may have been really a Roman. He was from Italy, and uh, Cornelius lived in Caesarea. Caesarea is north on the Mediterranean Sea, north of Joppa. Joppa is down a bit. Uh, Tel Aviv, if you look on a modern day map, you'll see Caesarea, Tel Aviv, and Joppa. Tel Aviv and Joppa are like twin cities. They're right together. So um, 
uh, Peter was in Joppa. Cornelius lived in Caesarea to the north. I want you to see what, what it, how it identifies him. He's a Roman army officer. He's a captain of the Italian regiment. And then the most important thing, he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. This is a remarkable thing, and I've often wondered how it was that Cornelius and his whole household were believers in the true God, in the God of the uh, Jews. He was a God-fearing man. He wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't a convert to Judaism, probably because he was a Roman army officer. But he believed. He was a believer in the one true God. And he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. What a wonderful person he must have been. He's the kind of person I think we'd all like to have in our churches, isn't he? The, just a good man who fears God. All the, His whole household loves God. They, he gives to the poor. He's generous. He prays. He's a great man. He's, God has really done something in his heart and in his life. One afternoon, about three o'clock, now I think this is very interesting because three o'clock was the time of the evening sacrifice down in Jerusalem at the temple. This was the very moment when the priest was about to slaughter the lamb that would be the evening sacrifice for the sins of all the people. Now, what time did Jesus die? You remember on Friday afternoon, if you remember, just type it right there in the comments. He died at 3 o'clock, which was highly significant because it was the time of the evening sacrifice. And you remember that at the moment of his death, the temple uh, curtain that divided the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. This was God's way of saying the temple sacrifices are no longer the way to approach God. We come through the blood of Jesus. Now, there's a situation here. And this is that we have a growing church that is made up almost entirely of Jewish or Hebrew Christians. Jews who have become Christians. But did they quit being Jews or belonging to the Jewish church? No, they hadn't quit being Jews, they were still following the feasts, they were doing the sacrifices, they were paying attention to things like circumcision and all of those kinds of things that made a Jew a Jew. But the church is growing. And you remember persecution has hit the church in Jerusalem, and so many of the Christian believers have spread out from Jerusalem into other parts of the world. They, there is no way that they are going to avoid reaching Gentiles who would want to become Christians. So how is that going to work? How are these devout Jewish Christians, are they even going to allow Gentiles into the church? Because even though they love Jesus with all their hearts, and they were followers of Christ. Did they know everything? No. Do we know everything? No. <laughs> so they were still learning. And they were still working off of the premise that Gentiles were unclean because they did unclean things. They touched unclean things. They didn't practice all the clean and unclean rules regarding personal hygiene, uh, sexual uh, practices, food practices washing of hands, laundry, all those kinds of things that were part of the clean and unclean regulations of the Jews. And I might add, some of them were from the Bible, but not all. Well, perhaps maybe not even most. There were many, many regulations that had been added by the Pharisees to ensure ritual cleanliness ritual cleanness uh, versus uncleanness. And they just did not see how Gentiles could do that. They didn't see how a Gentile could be clean. 
So notice when God sends the angel to Cornelius at the time of the evening sacrifice for the Jews. He is making a point here that his house is a house of prayer for all people, as Jesus said, and that he's starting something new here. Jesus is working. Jesus is working. An angel appears to Cornelius in a vision and starts moving towards him and calls him by name. Cornelius, the angel says. Verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in terror. No, duh. Angels are big. Angels are powerful. Angels are pure and holy. And almost every time the Bible records an, someone, a human seeing an angel, they're terrified. Sometimes they even pass out. They're so scared. And so Cornelius, this powerful man of war, this captain of the Italian uh, regiment, doesn't pass out, but he is terrified. What is it, sir? He asks the angel. The angel replies, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't say he, they've been received by God as merit. That God has counted, uh, counted that you are, are, are now worthy of being saved because of your good deeds. No, he says this is an offering. And that's what our good deeds are. Our good deeds do not gain us entrance to heaven. They are an offering of thanksgiving to God that he gives us entrance to heaven. And so he says, your gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. And I told you I was going to try to find my pictures of the, um, of the house that we saw in Joppa that is said to be the very house where Peter was staying with Simon, Simon the Tanner. Simon Peter was staying with Simon Tanner. And, but I didn't find the picture yet. If I can find it this evening, I'll post it. Isn't this interesting? The angel knows Cornelius's name. He gives Cornelius assurance that God loves him, that God accepts him. And then he says, I've got something special for you. Call, sends him in to call for Simon Peter and gives him Peter's name, Simon Tanner's name, and the address where they're staying in the city where the, in, of Joppa. God's got his eye on you, my friends. He loves you. He's watching you. He has, he knows your address. In fact, I've heard someone say, and I think it's true, that if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. That's how much he loves you. He cares about you. He knows everything about you. You are precious and important to him. So as soon as the angel had gone, Cornelius does exactly what he says, send some men to Joppa where, they were, where, um, where Peter was staying. He, he told them what had happened, of course, and sent them off to get Peter. Well, it didn't take them too long. And it's quite, it's quite a little ways. I don't remember exactly how far. It's maybe 30 35, uh, 30 or 40 miles if you go straight down the coast from uh, Caesarea to Joppa. So these men really made some good time. They left at, at something after three o'clock and they got uh, to Caesarea, uh, to Joppa be, oh, by noon. <laughs> they were really moving quickly. So it says that the next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on top of the flat roof of the house to pray. And it was noon, about lunchtime, and he was hungry. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've done this a lot of times. I've, been, I've thought, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm more tired or more hungry at the moment, but I'm going to take just a little short rest before I uh, eat. And that's exactly what Peter did. While the meal was, getting prepared, was being prepared, he lay down, took a little, maybe to take a little rest. And while he was lying down, he received a vision. And he saw, it says, he saw the sky open as something like a sheet came down from the sky filled with all kinds of, of animals. 
And these were animals probably like cats and dogs and horses and pigs and um, it says reptiles and birds. There were snakes. There might have been turtles in there. There were uh, vultures and eagles and I don't know what all kinds of birds were in there, but here, here's this whole sheet full of animals. And he hears a voice and says, you're hungry, Peter, get up, kill something and eat it. And Peter says, I can't eat this. No, no way, Lord. I can't eat this. I've never in my life eaten anything that our, that our laws of Moses say are unclean. And of course, you know, the unclean laws that anything that doesn't have a split hoof or choose the cud should not be eaten. Any fish that doesn't have fins and scales and no reptiles are to be eaten. Sorry. <laughs> I know a lot, a lot of people like to eat turtles, but no, that's not something that <laughs> Jesus said were good to eat. They have a good purpose. They're good animals. They're just not food. And um, of course, scavenger birds, they're not to be eaten either. And and Peter looks and he says, I, I can't eat that. There's no way I could eat that. I've never eaten anything like that. Never eaten any of those kind of animals. I've never eaten anything impure and unclean. And the voice spoke again to Peter and said, do not, verse 15, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And then the sheet went back up into heaven. A moment later, it happened again. A total of three times, Peter saw this sheet, heard the voice telling him to kill and eat. He responded the same way, saying, no way I can eat this unclean stuff. And the voice says, don't call something unclean if God has made it clean. And then Peter wakes up and is thinking, what was that? I must be hungrier than I thought. Either that or last night's pizza is really working on me. I don't know. He's, he's just thinking, wow. And he's just, in verse 17 says he was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men that Cornelius had sent found Simon's house standing outside the gate. Notice they, they understood Jewish laws. And they didn't try to go inside. They stood outside and they asked if a man named Simon Peter was standing there. They knew they had the right address. They were just being polite. They didn't go in. They were asking for Simon Peter. So while Peter is trying to figure out what was that dream all about, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Verse 19, three men. Three men. How many times did he have the dream? Three times. Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter runs downstairs, and he says, I think you're looking for me. Could I ask, um, wh what may I do for you? How may I help you? Why have you come? And they told him the story of what had happened the day before to Cornelius, that who Cornelius was, the kind of man he was, and what had happened with his vision of this angel that had told Cornelius to send specifically for Peter. And so um, Peter said, come on in. Come inside. Even though these were Gentile men, he invited them into Simon's house. I'm sure with Simon's full agreement. And the next day, he went with them accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. Now, this was really good, but this was sort of Peter realizing that something unusual is going on here, and he's going to need some, he's going to need some backup. <laughs> Not with the Gentiles. As we're going to see in chapter 11, who he's going to need the backup for is his own Jewish brothers up in Jerusalem. So he takes, takes brother, some believing brothers from Joppa up to uh, Caesarea, and they got to Caesarea the next day. So four days after um, Cornelius had the vision, they arrive at his house. Verse 24, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now remember, we'd already learned that his household was all dedicated to God. 
They all love God. And so now he calls in, probably broadens the circle just a little bit, people that he thought would be open and willing to hear this message. And as Peter entered his home, Cornelius was so overwhelmed that this messenger that God had told him to, to get, had given him the very address of this messenger of God, was here in his home. And he just falls down on, his, on the floor and just in worship to Peter. And Peter's like, no, 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 not me. Don't worship me. Don't worship me. He says, I'm a human just like you. There's nothing special about me. And so they, they started talking and then they went inside Cornelius's house. Now, this was also a big breach of Jewish law. Jewish people were not supposed to go in side the houses of Gentiles because they would be contaminated, ritually contaminated. They would be unclean. In fact, Peter, Peter says this, verse 28. He says, you know that it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone, anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for now tell me why you sent for me. This is, this was the most graphic way that God could have gotten this message across to Peter. To give him a vision of unclean animals, tell him to eat them, have Peter res resist that, and then tell him, don't call something unclean that I've made clean. And Peter's thinking, when did God ever make animals clean? <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. Jesus came to make people clean to purify hearts. That's what he came to do. And it just burst on Peter like a thunderbolt that God is doing something new here, that he's spreading the borders. He's spreading the borders of his spiritual tent, his temple. It's not just Jews. It's for all people everywhere, everywhere. And so Cornelius told him the story of the angel appearing to him four days before and how he had sent, told him to send for Peter and, and how he was so grateful that Peter had come. And he says, now we're all here, verse 33, waiting before God to hear the message that the Lord has given to you. And then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No favoritism. Is there anyone that God can't save? No. The only one God can't save is the one who refuses to be saved. He can save anyone, anywhere. And so Peter preached to them about Jesus. He explained to them about Jesus being, how did he say? He says, you know what happened, verse 37, throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his baptiz message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. So evidently, Cornelius had some awareness of Jesus. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Ju Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross but God raised into life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to those, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. In other words, he's a real person, a real body. He's not just a ghost. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, both the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Ah, oh, what a beautiful message he's giving, this message of a hope, this message of life, this message of joy, that God has actually come to earth. Oh, my friends, God himself has set foot here, and he came to save us. Verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on those who were listening to his message. And the Jewish believers who came with, the, with Peter were amazed. 
that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Now, how had the Holy Spirit been poured out? What was the, phys the, the physical manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit? The fire and the, the ability to speak in other languages. And that was exactly the same manifestation of the Holy Spirit that God gave to these new Gentile believers here in Caesarea. An Italian army Roman officer and his whole household, his family, his friends. And so Peter says, can anyone object to their being baptized? God has made it clear that he accepts them. Can we do anything less? And so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so Cornelius asked him to stay for several days. I just want to quickly hit verse chapter 11 because this is so good. You know, do you have you ever uh, kind of felt like your church has got a pretty good grapevine? You know, that news travels pretty fast throughout your church or your community of friends? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I don't think... We've got, yes, you're right. The soldiers under Cornelius came from different countries. So even better, they got to spread the gospel eventually to their home countries. Jesus is very efficient in the way that he works. He brought all these people from different countries together in one house to hear a message of salvation, to, to receive Jesus, and then they could take that home. What an incredible, what an incredible experience here. So, the, the early church had nothing on us in, in terms of grapevine. It was not long before the believers who were left in Jerusalem and the apostles, you remember, they were all still there. They heard about what had happened over in Caesarea. And so Peter, they, um, Peter arrives in Jerusalem and they criticized him for what he'd done, for baptizing Gentiles. What was he thinking? What was he thinking going into their house, eating food with them? He stayed with Cornelius for several days. What was he thinking? You, Verse 3, you entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. Then Peter told them what happened, starting with his dream, starting with the, and then telling about the story of Cornelius and his dream and the power of the Holy Spirit falling on them in exactly the same way that he had fallen on them just a few years before. And he said, verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? See, God had to do something very, very strong, very, very clear, very, very definite so that it would be accepted by the church, the church that was at that time predominantly Jewish. And so at that point, the others stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we get it. We can see that God has given even the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. We'll pick it up here next week. But wow, what a story. And we're going to, next week we're going to meet, oh, let's just finish this. It'll just take about one minute. It noted that those who were fleeing persecution in Jerusalem went to places like Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, Assyria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. But after, evidently, after hearing this story, some of them even started preaching, the, the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene started preaching to the Gentiles. So the believers from Jerusalem were preaching to the Jews, but those Jewish believers from Cyrene and Cyprus, they started preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. And so when the church in Jerusalem heard what was happening, they um, sent Barnabas down to Antioch. Now, you remember when we met Barnabas uh, a few chapters back, he was uh, one who sold property and gave the proceeds uh, 
to to help the poor believers in Jerusalem he was from Cyprus and so they thought okay he'll he'll fit well here he'll he'll be able to speak to the Gentiles and to the believers he'll be a good intermediary here and so he saw what was happening um, when he got to Antioch he saw what was happening and so then he decided that he was going to go over to Tarsus and get pick up Saul get Saul and, and bring him in let him uh, start using his gifts uh, Barnabas remember had befriended Saul and so he wanted to utilize Saul's gifts he didn't want Saul just to be sort of an exile there in Tarsus so he brought him in and it was at this time and in this place that the church became, started to be called Christian Christian little Christs they probably intended it as an insult but wow what a what a, an honor to be called a little Christ, a Christian, a follower of the Christ, one who acts like, thinks like, looks like Jesus. <laughs> That's us too. That's us too. And so we can see that the Holy Spirit was really moving powerfully. My friends, he is moving powerfully for us too. He is moving in our hearts. He, is, he does not show favoritism. Never doubt that the Holy Spirit is at work. In your life, in your community, He is. The Holy Spirit shows no favoritism. He's working everywhere. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the power of Jesus at work in Gentile lives. And thank you that that includes us, that Gentiles can, in fact, be included in your family that we can receive the Holy Spirit just as surely as did the first believers. And I thank you for that, Father. Lord Jesus, we ask for that in our lives, that we would have be filled with your presence, filled with your joy, that we would put aside our misconceptions, our prejudices, anything that keeps us from sharing the love of Jesus with everyone we can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for my friends. Bless them all that are here tonight. Ah, we love you, Lord. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Jesus be with you. We'll see you next week.